Many times in his life, St. Francis traveled on foot from Assisi to Gubbio. The Assisi Gubbio path recalls the occasions of these journeys, but in particular, it is an attempt to illustrate, in terms of the conversion of its protagonist, the profound significance of one trip to Gubbio along this path, begun by Francis in the year 1206. Francis's journey takes us back to the principles that inspired the Franciscan movement. Travel, understood as a condition for reaching whoever needs our help. Peace, as a cloak to be conquered. The serenity of the man who overcomes emblematic trials in order to mature spiritually. Love for creation and the natural environment. And the edification of the church as the spirit of service to the least of the helpless and living as a community. After renouncing his inheritance before the Bishop Guido II and his father Pietro di Bernardoni, at the end of the winter, Francis left his hometown and wandered into the woods. No more immediate wealth, but also no more scandals. No longer the weight of social climbing, nor the yoke of shame. No more socializing in the square, but not even a cave in which to hide from the feeling of being lost and alone. A great weight was on his heart, like a heavy blanket of snow made of fine powdery flakes that by themselves would never be felt, but falling one by one and accumulating could break strong branches or the roofs of the rich and the rotten coverings of hovels alike. But in many ways, it seems that this snow that still lies over Assisi and outside its walls did not fall by chance. Yes, it is a weight, the emblem of a spiritual weight, but it also means that little by little it will melt. The weight will be lessened and we will be free to go again, to speak again, to lift our hands to the sky, no longer stiff with cold. Then. We will remember the beauty of the snow, reduced to its dazzling whiteness, lacy border of frost on things that slowly, slowly reappear, the impetuousness of the water into which the harshness of winter dissolves. Francis is already moving beyond his own footsteps, a flooding stream rushing through the thawing town, skirting the walls, beginning its journey. Francis last utter a word to a human soul. How deep is the dismay under which his voice is buried. When he was still in the town, he reeked of the woods. Now that the forest surrounds him, and that every so often little noises, the snap of a twig, a flutter of wings, a whimpering, shake his body from the torpor in which it was left after his victorious confrontation with his earthly father. Now, for a moment he is amazed at hearing something come out of his mouth again. Something that does not seem to come from himself, but from some corner of the wood or from a sliver of blue amid the trees towering above. With the lure of song, the heavens have taken him back in their confiding conversations of love. Emerging from the woods, where at length he had sung praises to God in French, by now Francis is near the important fortified village of Val Fabrica. Continuing on his journey, Francis finds himself in a thaw and seeks some kind of shelter in a monastery besieged by waters. When conditions permit it, he sets off again for Gubbio, passing the Chiascio River near Barcaccia and following the path below the castle of Cocoran. Francis keeps walking along fields that have turned into swamps. When he must cross the Chiasho at the point called Barcaccia, the river also seems to have become a swampy pool. Looking up and down the river, its bends have disappeared into the endless bog. The bastion of Cocorano a castle that had been well known to him and whose hospitality he had welcomed 
appears to Francis as a monument of his youth which has suddenly gone silent. If someone from up in that castle recognized him and called him, how could they, he and that other person, renew their friendship other than by staring off into space? The river runs windingly now, its loops so sharp that it no longer merges with the fields it has flooded. We have reached the castle of Bishina. What an auspicious name for a fortress built on a site that everyone wants to have and no one wants to lose, that may belong to everyone, but nonetheless from time to time slips from their grasp. The glory of boundaries is short-lived, if they must remain such, passing through the hands of lords and brigands. All Francis can do is lift his heart to the highest point of the fortress and there, as if it were pure air, let it be pierced by the stare and the spear of every contender, so that every offence will fall into nothingness, and no more need be done other than to look out over the great wide world. Along this stretch of the path, within a few kilometers of each other, are a number of monuments of prime importance to the Franciscans. The Church of Caprignone, the Abbey of Valingegno, and the San Pietro in Vigneto Hermitage. The desperation of men became manifest in this journey, as the celestial voice had said, and as the biographer wrote, so that peace might be the companion of his poverty along his journey infested with danger, and by now only the veil of the flesh separates him from the vision of God. Were not the brigands desperate men, and deep down were not the very monks themselves desperate? And did they not negotiate with the body of Francis while his spirit was elsewhere, beyond his own words, his own deeds, suspended in his itinerarium in Deo? The bridge between the body and the spirit lies in those words of announcement, divine credential, and at the same time human elation. I am the herald of the great king. Not far from Gubbio by now, near the main road, Francis passes through those places where pilgrims flocked to receive care and hospitality outside the walls. The road that continues toward Gubbio along the top of the narrow hills has long since left the banks of the river. The entire way is hidden behind the sharp bends made for the climb to Valingegno, a wearying march already entered in history. Francis does not celebrate the weight that he has left behind. He does not emphasize his courage. If he must say, he would admit that history is bloody in Assisi as in Gubbio, in all of these villages that rise up from or sink down among the many valleys. will he find in Gubbio, that though re-immersing him in history will liberate him from it, and thus also liberate in the spirit the poor man suffering from leprosy and the rich man who is ill? Forgiveness. gates of Gubbio are the leper hospital of San Lazzaro and the small church of Santa Maria della Vittorina. From there, Francis reaches the city, entering at the gate of San Pietro or St. Peter. In a certain sense, the journey to Gubbio ends with a meeting between the saint and an old friend, Federico Spadalonga although the work that Francis did later with the lepers suggests that the real purpose of this long trek has not to do so much with the hospitality Francis received, but rather with the help that he gave to those who were much worse off than him and more in need. The 
courage of the light and the gaiety of the singer took over Francis's soul once again. The ecstasy of the trip was so intense as to triumph over all darkness, soothe all suffering, and make him indulgent to insult in every way. Even now, his conversion is so penetrating that it seems to Francis that either he had never really left Assisi, or else that he had made a very long journey in the space of an instant, such as might be dreamed by a man delirious with fever. And it is fever, the heat of a body come to life in the snow, a shiver that runs down one's overheated limbs in sultry weather, that brings Francis to his destination, the walls of Gubbio, beneath which is a great market square swarming with people. No one pays any attention at first, but then someone notices him, stops and stops the others. First, there is a complete but brief silence. Then, the voice of his friend calling him. While the square bustles again, St. Francis's fever becomes an indescribable warmth, which feels like spring and makes you move hands and lips as if in a prayer to be said with the one who in all things is minor. in the area, which would attack both animals and men. If anyone needed to leave town, they would do so only if armed, as if they were going off to battle. Moved to compassion by this, St. Francis decided to go and face the dangerous beast. With many curious townspeople looking on, he approached the wolf, which sprung to attack him. But all St. Francis had to do was raise his hand and make the sign of the cross, and the wild animal stopped and closed his horrible jaws. Brother Wolf, you do much damage around here, and you have committed great crimes, killing God's creatures, and not just beasts, but with detestable audacity, also men made in God's image. However, Brother Wolf, I wish to make peace between you and them, so that they are no longer harmed by you, and they will forgive you for every past offense, and neither men nor dogs will persecute you anymore. And the wolf moved its ears and tail to show that he agreed to these words. The wolf bowed its head, thus sealing its promise, which it never did break. During his 20-year journey, St. Francis traveled certain roads many times to places that he particularly loved. Francis believed that it is not the place that makes man holy. Rather, it is man that sanctifies the place in the silence of contemplation. Some of these loci, or places, preserve the memory of those visits and traditions that still speak from the heart. After leaving Gubbio, Francis set off for La Verna. He stopped at the 12th century abbey of San Benedetto di Podio, founded by his very dear friends, the monks of Fonte Avellana. After passing through the medieval village of Pietralunga, circled by walls and clustered around the ruins of the 8th century Lombard fortress with its massive tower, he came to Umbertide, the old town of early medieval origin with its elegant fortress. The townspeople built a church dedicated to him with a stone facade and a beautiful pointed arch portal to commemorate his passage. Another place especially dear to Franciscan tradition is Pregio, near Umbertide. which has a very old convent and church. A 
according to tradition, a friar entered the church to pray, carrying with him a reliquary, holding the holy thorn. And when he went out, he was struck with a sudden blindness. Inspired to go back in, he set the reliquary on the altar and immediately regained his sight. Because of this miracle, he donated the holy relic to the people of Predju. Over time, the Church of St. Francis has been filled with fine works of art, and it has become the destination of many pilgrimages. Francis passed through the throngs of people, he would always come to meet him. In Citerna, a small fortified village, there was not room to contain the whole crowd, so St. Francis would preach out in the open countryside. He stood in the shade of a great oak that was full of hens, and in the name of God, he commanded them to leave. The insects went away in an orderly procession, amazing the astonished assembly. A church was dedicated to him in Citerna as well, which has also been enriched with beautiful works of art over the years. traces of the presence of St. Francis in Città di Castello, where according to his biographers, he performed a number of miracles, such as freeing a possessed woman from the devil and healing a boy with a terrible wound. The people of Città di Castello also built a church dedicated to him. There is one place that Francis especially loved, the Buon Riposo Hermitage, called that by him because of the silence and peaceful rest he found when he passed through these lands. Starting as a small cave which grew into a hermitage and later a convent, it still stands in splendid solitude amidst the woods covering the hills outside Città di Castello. As Napoleone Guelfucci sang in 1595, At the foot of the mountain I found peaceful rest, known to the people, where I lifted my head and my soul in devotion. As of old my forebears, in honor of the Queen of Heaven, built that place from its foundations. When St. Francis reached the village of San Sepulcro, multitudes came quickly from all over to see him and touch him. But Francis, as told in the little flowers of St. Francis, going with his mind elevated and enraptured in contemplation of God, he heard nothing that was said or done around him. Nor did he realize that he had passed by this castle or through that quarter after passing the village, emerging from his meditations. He asked his companion, When will we reach the village? Truly his soul, enwrapped in contemplation of celestial matters, neither heard nor felt anything earthly. Another place especially loved by Francis was the convent of Monte Casale, where he stayed several times. There are many stories about this magical place, the most well-known being that of the conversion of the three thieves. It is told that one day they came to the convent and asked for something to eat, but were sent away. When Francis heard what had happened, 
He called Friar Anuel, the keeper of the convent, and scolded him and ordered him to take food to the thieves in the forest. Friar Agnolo obeyed, and the three thieves came quickly to St. Francis. They renounced Satan and his works. They began to do much penance, and St. Francis took them into the order. Standing at the top of an almost inaccessible hill overlooking a broad landscape is the castle of Montaldo, the estate of his dear friend, Count Alberto de Barbolani. The story goes that during his last visit to the Count, Francis foretold the Count's imminent death, saying it would be due to the infirmity from which he was suffering. When Count Alberto asked Francis for something to remember him by, Francis gave him his ragged tunic, receiving in turn a piece of cloth from which a new garment would be made for the saint. After passing through Anghiari, St. Francis reached the village of Pieri Santo Stefano and went up into the hills to another place steeped in mysticism, the Hermitage of Cebaiolo. There is a famous saying that describes this place well. Whoever has seen La Verna, but not Cebaiolo, has seen the mother, but not the child. Josue Carducci, the great Tuscan poet, describes this magical mountain place in one of his lyric poems. You look toward heaven, Cebaiolo, descending from the crags of the Apennines, like a giant who woke late and hurries off to hunt and questions the morning. You still smile on me, and when laboring over empty sheets, the tired soul aspires to the cool breezes. It will come to you, verdant hills, austere and blissful crags. After Assisi, La Verna is the second most important place for the Franciscans. The mountain at La Verna was donated to St. Francis by Count Orlando da Chiusi di Casentino when they met at St. Leo, as is told in the Little Flowers. In Tuscany, I have a very inspirational mountain, which is very wild and solitary, and is perfectly suited for those who wish to do penance in a place far removed from the people or for those who desire a solitary life. If you like it, I would gladly give it to you and your companions for the well-being of my soul. When Francis arrived at La Verna in 1224, together with his companions, Massio, Leone, and Angelo, it was August and very hot. A peasant offered his donkey to Francis, who was very tired, his body exhausted by various sufferings. Halfway up, the peasant complained that he was thirsty, and Francis got down from the donkey, knelt, and said to the peasant, Run, go at once to that rock, and there you will find flowing water, which Jesus Christ just now, through his mercy, made come out from the stone. He ran to that place that St. Francis had showed him, and found a beautiful spring produced from hard rock by virtue of St. Francis's prayer, and he drank abundantly and was restored. During his stay up there, a falcon, which had its nest there, formed a sincere friendship with him. During the night, it would signal with the sound of its song the hour at which the saint was in the habit of rising for his divine office. However, when the servant of Christ felt the weight of his illness more than usual. The falcon would spare him and did not give his call so early. As if trained by God, it would ring the bell of its voice only at the break of dawn. On September 14th, 1224, the Feast of the Exaltation of the Holy Cross, Francis received the stigmata suspended in the middle of a sun that set the rocks on fire, Francis saw the vision of a crucified angel that filled him with a great, irresistible love. 
the five open wounds. He returned it with an equal love, savoring the joy of giving and receiving. And giving his life thus became for St. Francis the perfect union with Jesus Christ, the perception of having become the living image of the passionate God. Dante wrote in the eleventh canto of Paradise, On the hard rock, twixt Arno and the Tiber, he from Christ took the last signet, which his limbs two years did carry. The mountain at La Verna holds a thousand messages of beauty, of strength, of silence, of seeking, and of peace. But all are but a faint reflection of that night, in which the mountain of La Verna seems to burn with the brightest flame, which glowed and illuminated all the mountains and valleys around it, as if it were the sun above the earth. Francis's health was failing at La Verna, which, after Calvary, the world has no other mountain so holy, as is written on the door by which one enters the convent. Goodbye, mountain of God, holy mountain. Goodbye, Mount Alvernia. May God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit bless you. Rest in peace, as we will see each other no more. Francis's journey began with the renouncing of earthly possessions. The places that were so dear to him allow one to breathe in the intense fragrance of nature with all its many colors, even if, according to St. Francis, we should not love things because they are beautiful or enchanting, but simply because they are creations of God. Walking like St. Francis along the paths of life, following his footsteps, understanding that we should live in poverty, in peace and with love, can help the world to understand the profound meaning of his message and his life. Thank you.